we are finally up to the end of the inventory series. Last time we made inventory slots selectable in specific inventories where we allow selection and we disallowed drag and drop operations in things like this because we are making a shop. Today we're going to be rounding up the entire series by making the shop into an actual shop where we can buy and sell items to this shop to make a fully functioning item system. Now the first thing we're going to need to add here is number one uh, a value for money that's actually the easiest thing because that's just adding a variable and number two we need a way to account how many items we're going to buy or sell because obviously we don't want to just every time we click on a button uh, sell only one item or buy only one item because if you have a game where you want to buy like a thousand ammo at once something like that you don't want to have to click that a thousand times you want to be able to set the value in like a little box and then buy in bulk so First things first, going into our inventory component. Uh, this is going to be very, very easy. We'll just make a variable called money. And that will be a float value. Why a float value, you might ask? Because float values are usually nice to calculate things with. We'll display these in integers, uh, but behind the scenes, it will allow us to have like half a money, which is usually quite nice because it allows you to divide a little bit easier and that kind of stuff. If you really are insistent on making this an integer, you can. Usually, I only use integers for when I'm like counting indexes and stuff. Everything else is just a float. But the more important part is making the uh, shop counter. So let's go into our inventory items and make a new user interface here, which will be a user interface called a WBP uh, counter because we're going to be counting things. It's just that obvious. And we'll drag this over to my main monitor and start off by adding in a overlay an overlay because we're going to want to add in a couple of different elements here not least of which are going to be uh two buttons you might want to make this more buttons you might want to do this in a lot of different ways we're going to do this with buttons because it's the easiest and most straightforward way to do it so we'll add two buttons one for increasing the amount of things we want to buy and one for decreasing Again, you can also make this like four buttons, one button for increasing by one, one button for increasing by 10, one button for decreasing by one, one button for decreasing by 10. Make it six buttons, also add the hundreds or the thousands or the ten thousands. You can make this as much as you want. We're going to go for one on one. So this will be the increase button and this will be the decrease button and for the decrease button we want to align this one to the right side of the overlay in between we're going to put a little bit of text and that text is going to display the amount of items that we're trying to transact so let's align this one to the middle and also make sure that the justification for it is also a center text aligned we'll set the preview text to zero because that's it's going to be a number, right? Then we can open up the graph here and uh, add a variable simply for the counter, which uh, since we're counting things, I just talked about this, uh, it's going to be an integer. And we'll also add a value for the maximum that we're allowed to count up to. Because if we are hovering over, or if we have a item selected that only has a stock of like 20, we don't want to be able to set this up to like trying to buy 50. Because dealing with that on the moment where we press the transaction button is a lot more bothersome than just preventing people from getting that far in the first place. So let's add events for both of our buttons. This is the decrease button. We'll add on clicked for that. And for the increase button, we'll also add on clicked. And for both of them, we're going to just get our counter. And for the decrease button, we're going to do minus minus, which is decrement integer. And for the increment button, I think you know what we do. We do plus plus increment integer. Now, this is where the max value comes in because we're also going to then try to clamp that integer between a value of zero and the maximum amount of items that we're allowed to have at any given time. The output of which uh, we'll use to then again set our counter value because that's how clamping works. So we just hook that both up from both events into this setting node, which is hooked up to this clamping node. And that is kind of everything there is to it for now. 
And then we want to add an event dispatcher just to let the rest of the UI know that, hey, we just updated something. You might want to recalculate some prices and stuff like that. So we add an event dispatcher that's called on counter updates. And we simply call that at the very end here. Quick PSA, uh, I'm halfway through this video and I figured out that I actually uh, aligned these two the wrong way around. So uh, if you get confused at any point in time, uh, that might be why, if you're following along very precisely. Um, increment button on the right, decrement button on the left. And then we can set the text here to just uh, bind to the counter value. So it will now always just display the counter value. Now with that, we can go back to our shop and start adding in those counters. So we have the WBP counter for this side. And then we'll also probably want to actually uh, anchor that to a decent spot as well. And then we'll add one on this side as well. So we'll have one counter for buying things and one counter for selling things, just because I like it that way. You can have one counter for either, just because it makes things a little bit easier to program. Uh, let's give these things names. The one on the shop side we'll call counter buy, because we're buying things from the shop. And the one on the player side we'll call a uh, counter sell because we're selling items to the shop now we also want to add in uh two buttons for the actual uh, transaction when we decide hey this is the amount of items that i want to buy and or sell uh we want to have a button to press so let's add in uh, those with the proper anchoring as well i'm kind of adding these very just eyeballing their position obviously you want to set these to be a little bit more neatly organized if you're doing this for the actual game both of those buttons i'm also going to put the text in uh because the text that we're going to put in here is going to simply display uh, the value of the transaction that we're about to do you can place this on other places on your screen if you want to uh, i like just putting them in the button uh the display preview is just going to be zero we want to uh align this at the center and we'll do that for both of these buttons. Now, there was a lot of UI set up. Now we can finally go into the graph and start doing some programming. So we have this event construct. And really what we're going to do there is we're just going to be binding to a lot of the event dispatches that we have set up. So let's move these update item grids a little out of the way for now. Because what we're going to need to add in is our uh, boy counter and our cell counter. And for both of those, we need to assign on counter updated. Uh, and that will make on counter updated event. Uh, let's also call this specifically uh, for buying. And we'll do the same thing here assign on counter updated cell. And that will create our events that run every single time we update those counters we've just made. So every single time we're going to increment or decrement those values what we want to do is we want to recalculate a couple of values that we're going to be making on this blueprint and after those we still do want to update the item grids and such so do keep in mind you want to reconnect those up now for this we're going to make two variables uh the first one will be our boy price which is the price of the items we currently have selected multiplied by the amount of things that we're trying to buy uh, so that will uh, be a float naturally and we'll also make a corresponding value for the sell price which will be used for the exact same thing so whenever we update our boy counter we're going to update our boy price and the same thing for our sell counter and our sell price and now we just need to calculate those values and luckily that's actually uh, remarkably easy so let's move this stuff a little bit out of the way and get our stuff uh, set up so we have these components up here which is our chest inventory component we probably should rename this to shop inventory component uh because we're working with a shop now not just with a chest but we'll deal with this for now so let's get this uh, out of here and we want to get the inventory array that we made on that component ages and ages and ages ago from that, we want to get a copy of a certain index. We can split the structure pin, and we'll worry about all that in a moment. The index that we're going to be getting will be our item grid for the chest, and there we will have the get currently 
selected index, which we set up in the last video where we made all of the uh, stuff about selecting the slots in the inventory. That will now give us access to whatever type of item we're trying to buy. And our item class has a value on them that we set up for every single item. So simply we can just multiply that value by the amount of things that we're trying to buy. And we have the uh, buy counter, obviously, and that has the counter value. So we can simply hook that up into there and that will be our buy price. And our sell price is going to be honestly much of the same. So what we'll do is we'll just copy this entire thing over and we need to only replace a couple of the components because instead of the chess inventory components, of course, this is going to be using the player inventory components. It's going to be using the player item grid instead. So we can delete the other one. And instead of the boy counter, of course, it's going to use the sell counter. And just as easily as that, we have both of these set up. Now that we have those, we can actually uh, make these little text here display the corresponding values. Also, I prefer setting the color for these to, uh, to black because they're a little bit easier to read against the gray buttons. We're going to come up here to the text content and we want to create a new binding. And this is the binding for the cell. So we just plug the cell price into the return value here. It'll create a two text node, which we're actually going to set to uh, maximum fractal digits uh, zero, meaning that we don't want to have any decimal points displaying here. You can enable and disable grouping, which is like the, uh, the comma or the dot, depending on your region. Uh, and we will, of course, do the same thing for the other as well. So we'll create a new binding and just hook up the uh, boy price in much the same way, which will set to no decimals as well. And that sets up the price calculations uh, for everything. So now we just need to add two more events for when we update which item we are trying to buy. So let's get the item grid for the chest and the item grid for the player. And if you've seen the last video, which if you haven't, you're probably very confused right now as it is, uh, you'll notice that we, I'll just show you actually, in the item grid, we made a new slot selected event dispatcher. Every time we select a new slot, we call that one. And we're going to be using that now. So we can assign on new slot selected uh, for the boy. And we'll also do assign on new slot selected for the cell. And of course, we need to hook these up into the execution flow. So let's do that real quick. And then make sure to, again, also include the update item grid. When we select a new item, we want to set the max value of the counter corresponding to that inventory. And if that counter was already higher than the value that was allowed, we want to also clamp that to whatever the new maximum value is. And then we also want to update uh, the boy prices and stuff like that. So that's actually remarkably easy. We can start with the chest inventory component and once again, just get the inventory out of that. And we've seen this before. We can get a copy and we want to get the chest item grid, get the selected index and put that into this getting node. In short, uh, it's the exact same thing that we did over here down to the fact that we're going to split the structure pin. But instead of using the item asset, which is what we did this for the last time, what we're actually after here is the stack size. So however many items are in this stack is going to be setting the maximum amount of things for our boy counter. So let's get the boy counter and we want to set the max. And that max will just be the stack size or whatever stack we just selected. And then we also want to set the counter itself to whatever its current value is or the clamped max. So we'll do something very similar to what we did before. And that is we want to uh, get the counter and we want to try to clamp that one between zero and whatever this new maximum value is. So just the stack size and that will be our new counter amount. After we've done that, we want to run our update prices, but we already wrote that function over here because that's what we do every single time we update the counter as well. 
uh, but we also can just run that as a normal event so we can just update the boy price and that will allow us now to select new items to buy we'll do the same thing with selling uh, i'll go through this a little bit faster we'll just copy over the setup from the counter sell thing that we did and we'll simply copy these over as well hook this up to the new event that we made here which is on new selected event sell of course that's going to be the stack size going into the max the stack size going into the max of the clamp node the only big difference is that we need to swap out the counter boy of course for the counter sell we're dealing with the inventory that's going to be doing the selling and that's how easily we can duplicate uh that function we could make this just into like a function that we could use for both of these probably should i didn't and at the very end here we want to update the sell prices and with that we should now be able to select this thing in this inventory and use our counter to say okay i want to buy five of them well we've set this thing up way in the beginning to have a value of two so it displays a value of 10 here now the only thing that we need to do and i will just show you real quick if i take items out of this chest as well uh, the sell side of things works just the same way uh, the only thing we need to do is to make the buy and sell buttons themselves actually work and for that we need to make sure that we uh, select the right buttons i don't think i even gave those names so this will be the buy button and we'll also rename the sell button both of those are going to have on clicked events so the sell button and then we have the boy button as well on clicked and for this we're going to make one single function that's just going to deal with all of this for us because there's quite a lot of node setup to copy over so for this one i'm actually going to make a separate function so let's come up here to the functions and uh, we'll just call this boy sell and this is going to have a few values so let's get started by making them uh, we want to have the inventory that is doing the buying which will be a inventory component reference we want to have the inventory that's doing the selling so we do the inventory to sell we want specifically a reference to the item grid that we're selling from not that we're buying from so uh, that will be our grid to sell and that is going to be of type item grid of course so wbp item grid object reference then we want to have the corresponding counter for that grid so we can make a counter which of course will be of type wbp counter and then we also want to have the corresponding price so the amount of money that will be uh, transacted and that will of course be a float so that's going to be all the inputs that this function is going to take there's quite a lot of them but that's the exact reason that i wanted to make this a function because otherwise there's going to be a lot of things all over the place it just doesn't look that the very first thing that we're going to do is adding in a branch because we're going to be checking whether or not uh, the amount of things that we're trying to buy can we even afford it right so what's actually quite nice is that when you make a function in blueprint all of these parameters are just accessible as if they were local variables already so we can say uh, the price we can just get that without needing to actually get all of these little noodles all over the place which is just very very nice and in the same way we can get the inventory to buy because the thing that's trying to buy we want to uh, get the amount of money in that inventory because we need to compare that to the price of what i was trying to buy and the price needs to be less than or equal to the amount of money that we have and if that is the case then we may progress if not uh you're trying to buy something you can't afford if we progress we're going to do a for loop with break this is very important because we want to be able to break out of it uh, for reasons that i will talk about in a moment the first index we're going to set to one usually when you do a for loop the first index almost always zero this is one of those rare cases that we're actually using this to count through something rather than using them as actual indexes so we're going to be using our first index one here and the last index will be our counter and 
from that we're going to get our counter so the amount of things that we're trying to buy is how often we're going to be looping through this for loop now in the loop body we want to get the inventory to buy again and on that we have a function already for add item and add item is simply going to loop through the inventory and see if there's any spot in the inventory that can take in the specific item that we're trying to put in so is there any empty slots or is there any slots that i can merge into uh, where a stack already exists that's not full and we're going to do that on each loop so we're going to add these items one at a time to prevent people buying like 50 items in a slot that they can only have like another 10 items inside we don't want people to like overrule the amount of items that are allowed to stack on top of each other so we need to add them one at a time this function already has a output whether or not that succeeded so if it goes through the entire inventory and doesn't find a single open slot that it can put this specific item into uh, it's going to return a false and if it does that that is where the break comes in for with the for each loop with break and i'll just add a couple of rerouting notes to make this look a little bit more readable for you all now let's back up a little bit because we need to figure out what item are we trying to add and for that we use the grid to sell and from that we get the selected index using the inventory to sell we can then from that of course get our inventory array and use a getting node to figure out what item is in the currently selected slot in that inventory so let's split that open and that item asset can go into our item to add here so that is how we get that all working and let's put this into a slightly more visually pleasing configuration now back into this for each loop uh, if we can add the item if that was a success uh, we want to subtract that item from the inventory that's doing the selling so we want to get the inventory to sell and on this we're actually going to need to make one last function uh, on our inventory component so let's make that and that will be to subtract specific item and it will just take in an index on which slot to subtract just simply one from so we can add the input here for that uh, and we'll just take in a index make it an integer and this doesn't need to be particularly small or anything because we're always going to just be subtracting from the own inventory so we don't need to make this compatible with multiple inventory interactions or whatever uh, we're going to put in a branch to start with i don't know why i'm typing that out instead of just using b and click here we are because what we need to figure out is if subtracting one means that we just remove the rest of the stack we're going to need to set the entire stack to just be non-populated so that another item can take its place when the time comes uh, if there is items left in the stack we just need to subtract one from it so let's get the inventory here and we want to of course uh, get a copy use the index for the getter and we want to uh, split the structure pin because we're going to pretty much be using all of the values in here first though we want to worry about the stack size we want to check the stack size minus one so we subtract one uh, and we want to check whether or not that is greater than zero still if it is not greater than zero which means that if somehow somebody managed to buy their way into the stock being negative uh, this also will just immediately fix that what we'll do is we will uh, set the array elements so set array element at the corresponding index here so that will be the index that we put in for subtract item uh, and then we're going to split the structure pin here as well and we'll use the inventory node that we have here and then we want to set has item to false item stack will be zero item asset will be nothing and the item index for this slot will still just be whatever index that we're working with however if this ends up being true we also want to set array element but we do need to do a slight bit more uh, work so let's hook up the proper inventory array for this uh, the index is still going to be actually we can just get that this way there we go as just a simple note to make things a little bit less messy so um we set the index we still have has item 
uh, the item asset itself is going to be whatever item asset came out of our getting node here from the array. And the stack size will be whatever that stack size was minus one. So out of the math node, we're going to put that into the stack size here. And then, of course, after either one, we want to uh, call on inventory changed because that's what we do at the end of all the functions in this component. Now we have a function where we can just say, hey, this index subtract one item and it will do the rest for us. So going back into our shop here, uh, we're still in the buy sell function. Uh, we have the inventory to sell. We can simply say subtract item and we need to pass in the index of whatever item we're trying to subtract from. Luckily, we already have an easy way to do that, and that is just getting the grid to cell selected index. So we can just copy that over and use that as the index for subtract item. Now, after that item has been subtracted, we need to remove the corresponding amount of gold from the item's value from the buying inventory and add it to the selling inventory, which is actually quite easy because we already have whatever item we are trying to uh, transact here through the item asset. So we can simply get the value from that. And then the inventory to buy is going to uh, get the current amount of gold that they have, or money, I think I called it. There we go. And we're simply going to subtract the value from that item from it. We don't need to multiply by anything because the way we're doing this with a loop, we're moving through these, iterating through them one at a time. So we just need to, every time we go through the loop body, we need to remove the value of one item. And then in the inventory to buy, we also need to uh, set the money then to the new value. So we hook up that new value and we set it. And then in the inventory to sell, we just kind of do the reverse. So we get the inventory to sell. We have a node here for that already. We set the money and that amount of money is going to be whatever money there already is. So get money plus the value of set item. Now, of course, this can be a little bit more neatly organized, which again, I will do after the recording, before I upload the finished project, all of the blueprints will be more neatly organized so that if you're going through this as a YouTube member or a Patreon, uh, you'll actually be able to read through what things do a little bit better. And that is the entire full loop. Now we need to just do some stuff uh, on the completion of this loop. And that's just kind of a quality of life thing, uh, because what we want to do is we want to uh, get the grid that is doing the selling. So get grid to sell. And from that, we want to uh, get the wrap box and the target index. So the uh, selected index. And what we're going to check here is after we've sold an item, if that item slot is now empty, we want to automatically deselect that item slot because otherwise we keep having that slot selected and it just looks a little bad, honestly. So we'll just, uh, from the wrapper box, get child at the index that we just got. And of course, we will need to cast that to our widget blueprint item slot. And that one we can connect up to the completed pin of the for loop with break. So here we can simply check now if whatever item slot that we're working with, uh, we get the inventory slot information out of that. And if we split that open, we simply check whether or not the stack size uh, is still greater than zero. Because if it is greater than zero, we don't really need to do anything. Uh, but if it is not greater than zero, we set selected to being false. And we also, of course, get the image border. At this point, it probably would have been better to make a function on this thing to just set the image border to a certain thing instead of doing this getting of that specific component time after time after time again. Uh, but that's something that you can do on your own time, improving the code and workability of things a little bit more than they are right now. Uh, but we can set, of course, the brush from texture and the texture that we can set it to is the inventory slots. Realistically, you could do something with like a enum that's just automatically updating the image uh, much easier through a simple function rather than this roundabout way of doing things. But for now, this will work. 
And that is the entire buying and selling function done. Now, you can see why we didn't want to uh, copy over all of these nodes and change only a couple of values around for both the buy and the sell version of this. So we just make one function and whenever we run that, we run it as buy sell. And we just hook that up to both of the buttons and now just have to put in the corresponding values. So when we click the on sell button, the player is selling something. So the inventory to buy is the shop. And of course, the inventory to sell is the player, obviously. The grid that is doing the selling is going to be the player item grid. So that'll be this one. And the counter will be our selling counter. The price that we're going to be working with will be the selling price as well. And that's how easy we can set that up. And for the other button, we'll do the exact opposite. So the inventory to buy is going to be the player because we're buying something, uh, which is getting sold from the shop. So the grid is also going to be the shop one. It's called a chest still. Um, it's because I'm bad at naming. The counter will be the buy counter and the price will be the buy price. And then after each one of these, we just need to um, run the on selected new slot event for the corresponding thing. So we want to do the uh, boy one for the top one. And then on new selected for selling, we do the other way around. That's entirely my bad. So the selling function on the selling button, of course, and the buying function on the buying button. Quite as easy as that. Now, one last thing that I have not added yet is uh, the display of the money on either side of the screen. I kind of forgot to add in the text for that, uh, but that's quite easy. So we can just add in a text. Uh, we can just put that on the canvas panel. That's fine. And you can put those anywhere you want on screen, obviously, as usual. So let's put that on the bottom right side here. Align that somewhat decently. Honestly, this is going to not align very well. But making a well scalable UI is not exactly the main priority of what we're doing here. So let's just get it to be good enough and we'll stick with that. Now, the text block here, I'm going to uh, justification on from left to right. And this one, I'm going to do right to left, actually, just because it'll look a little bit nicer. The preview text for both, I'm going to just set at zero. Just looks a little bit nicer uh, than having text block in there and here we can just create a binding so this is the amount of money that the inventory component has so we can just simply say inventory component um so we can just simply create a binding for that get the player inventory component get the money i should point out that if your money is an integer you can just do this directly without having to make a binding i'll show you how with the next one so for the shop one uh you can just say hey just inventory components, uh, and it shows up with integers here to uh, to display. Of course, our money is not an integer, so we can't do that. So we need to create a binding instead and do it this way. It's honestly not that big a deal, but it's good to note. And also, uh, I do want to make sure that it doesn't display any decimal points. Let's set the default amount of money that an inventory component has when it spawns into like 500, 501. Why not? I made a typo, but let's just pretend like that wasn't entirely on purpose. Uh, let's check out whether or not it displays. So both of the inventories have 501 gold. As I said, they're horribly outlined. Uh, don't worry about that for the time being. And let's try to buy something. So we can select this inventory slot and we can increase the amount of things that we're trying to buy. We buy them and we can see that it adds them to our side of the screen. And we want to buy seven again. And you see, it only has six items left in this slot here. And now this maximum amount of items that we can select is six, which is quite nice. It did seem to deselect things there for a moment. Uh, so that's something that might be worth looking into. As you can see, it had a stock of 20 rocks, but of course, rocks we have set to only allow for stacking up to 10. So when it moves them to our inventory, because it's doing it one at a time, looking for the first inventory slot that it's allowed to be put inside, it splits them neatly into two stacks of 10. And I can, of course, sell them back to the shop for, at the moment, just the same amount of money that I paid for them in the first place. Uh, of course, you can easily set up something uh, where you create a sell price function 
on the item itself. Which then also obviously impacts some of the parts that we're doing here. Because now you can't reuse the same function for both of these. So that complicates things a little bit. But I think you, having followed along with all of this, probably understand somewhat how to do that. And the one little bug that we had before with the item becoming unselected is purely a visual thing, I might add. But it is still something that we probably want to... So the little bug there where the item slot got deselected after buying something, uh, it's quite easy to fix. It's because every single time we change the inventory visually on screen, we regenerate the entire inventory. So when we regenerate the entire inventory, we need to go ahead and check for each slot whether or not it is the currently selected slot. And if it is, we need to generate it with the proper border around it. So the way we do that is we, in our item grid, get the create item slot widget and we get the inventory slot information and at the very end here after add child to wrap box uh, let's split the structure pin we want to check whether or not the slot index is equal to the currently selected slot or index putting that into a branch node if it is we just want to uh, set that to true. And once again, if we had a, a function made for this, which we probably should have, uh, this would have been a lot easier, but we can now simply just set selected to being true for that one and hook that up to our branching node. And we can use this same strand here to uh, get image for the border and set brush by text. So we've done this a million times by now. So you probably can figure out how to set a brush from texture at this point and we'll use inventory slot number three and that should fix the visual bug with the inventory slot seemingly getting deselected you will note that the first slot in either inventory is now by default selected that's because we are setting the currently selected index to being active and the default value for that is set to zero Obviously, the 0th index is going to, by default, be set to active. Honestly, I don't think this is that big of a deal. We just need to make sure that this only happens with inventories that allow you to select slots. So if we uh, go into the inventory for the player now, we see it also happens here. But this is not supposed to allow uh, selecting a slot. So we'll fix that in a moment as well. But we can now select a few items and buy them, and only when the item slot runs out will it actually deselect the slot. So that is quite nice. So in this branching node, we also want to check uh, if allow select for the grid itself is uh, enabled. So we just make this into an end boolean instead. Uh, that way it doesn't impact our normal inventory anymore. But it does impact our shop inventory. So now in the game, if I open up my inventory, you can see it no longer does it here. But if I open up the shop, it still does it there. Now, the very last thing that you might want to do is if you are running into a issue, and this is just fixing a couple of little bugs, uh, where this thing does seem to be selected at first, but you can't increase the amount, uh, which you will see in a moment here. If I buy this and I try to increase the amount on this side, it's not letting me because it shows it to be selected, but it actually isn't quite selected yet. Um, and that might be a issue. It's easy to fix. Just clicking on it, I will make it actually selected and you can just buy and sell all you like. But that can be a little bit annoying. And of course, you don't want that in your game. So at the very end of our event construct, we have our update item grids. To that, we're also simply going to add uh, all of the events that we're binding to these uh, event dispatches here. So that is update event buy, update event sell, update selected buy, and update selected sell. So if we just add those to the end here, so update buy, update sell, and then on new slot selected buy, and new slot selected cell once you've added all of those to the end as well uh, that bug now also should be fixed so we can open up this chest and immediately start buying things without having to double select things and just have it be a little bit messy and honestly if we're doing that uh coming down here to the buy and sell buttons uh what we can just do is at the very end of the function itself 
uh, what we simply want to do is we can just update item grids. So that way it just updates both of them anyway. Um, just makes things a little bit more compact and a little easier to deal with. So now we can immediately start buying these things and then we can also immediately start selling them back without having to do weird double selecting stuff and all that. Uh, we have a functioning shop now. So again, I'm going to clean up a lot of the blueprints uh, for this and then it will be up for download. For you guys, it has been up for download since the first episode because I'm recording this way, way, way in advance. I hope this has been helpful. I hope you've learned a thing or two and I'm going to start working on the next big series after this. So if you want to support that and get access, of course, to all of the project files, uh, you can down below subscribe to the Patreon or become a YouTube member and get access to all that and support me at the same time. There will be a link down below in the description to the Patreon where you can find a little bonus episode where we go over and change some things to make some alternative ways to interact with the inventory, which will be a Patreon exclusive episode. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. And a special thanks to my Cave Digger tier Patreons, Sergey Thomas, 